This is the M2 Max 16 inch MacBook Pro I've been using since May of 2023. I've been working on school assignments, editing videos, and even doing some 3D modeling. And now that we're well into 2025, let's talk about what it's been like living with this machine for almost two years. So here's the exact spec I've been using. It's an M2 Max with a 12 core CPU, a 38 core GPU, 32 gigabytes of unified memory, and a one terabyte SSD. It's definitely powerful, but as we'll get into, Power doesn't always equal practicality. That's especially depending on your workflow or your day-to-day -day use. So let's kick things off with the hardware. And right away, as you'd expect from Apple, the build quality is excellent with a solid aluminum build that feels super premium. It sports the slightly thicker design introduced with the 2021 MacBook Pro, which is awesome. You get a larger battery, better thermals, and of course, more ports. On the left side, we've got a MagSafe 3 port, two Thunderbolt 4 ports, and a headphone jack that supports high impedance headphones. On the right, there's an HDMI 2.1 port, another Thunderbolt 4 port, and an SD card slot. Now, most of the time, I just use MagSafe for charging and Thunderbolt for connecting a monitor or a few other accessories. But I'm not gonna lie, there have been more than a few times where having built an HDMI and an SD card slot have come in super clutch. Although that being said, this design does come with a pretty big trade-off. A bigger chassis, of course, means more weight. Now, I typically carry it in a messenger bag and sometimes in a backpack, but in either case, I can really start to feel the weight on my shoulders when carrying it for more than like 10 minutes. I've pretty much gotten used to it by now since I've loaded it for so long, but I definitely see the appeal for the MacBook Air. If you tend to use your laptop docked at a desk most of the time, this won't be a problem like at all. But if you're more mobile, this is definitely something to consider. Now, other than the weight, the only real hardware complaint I have is some creaking on the bottom panel. I really only ever notice it whenever I put pressure on that area. Otherwise, I never hear it, so it's not a huge deal. Now the display. It's a 16.2 inch liquid retina XDR display that supports 120 Hertz ProMotion. Now those words probably mean absolutely nothing to most people, but here's what actually matters. This screen is incredible, and it's the single reason I cannot switch to a MacBook Air. Everything's super sharp, colors are super vibrant, and thanks to the mini LED backlight, it gets pretty close to OLED black levels. Now it also gets bright. It can do 500 nits for SDR content, 1000 nits sustained for HDR, and up to 1600 nits for HDR highlights. Now I will say I do use an app called Better Display to upscale SDR brightness to the full thousand nits, but I only do that when absolutely necessary. It chews through battery and makes the screen a little warm after a while. Anyways, the screen also has ProMotion, which is Apple's variable refresh rate technology that dynamically adjusts from 24 hertz to 120 hertz, depending on what's happening on the screen to save battery. Now I've found that once you've lived at the 120 hertz, going back to a static 60 hertz feels pretty choppy. Unless, of course, you have a device that can do 120 hertz, but you keep it on low power mode 24 seven. You know who you are. Now, hot take, I actually really like the notch. I know I'm basically alone in this, but I think it looks pretty clean. Now behind it is the 1080p FaceTime camera that actually looks pretty decent for a built-in webcam. The image does look a bit fuzzy, but it's passable. Although pro tip, you can just use continuity camera to have your iPhone's rear camera be your webcam, which gives you much better video quality. The only real issues I've had with the screen are blooming and some weird air bubble looking spots. Now, blooming is way less noticeable here than on something like an M1 or M2 iPad Pro, but it's definitely still there, especially when you've got bright elements against a dark background or if you're using it in a dark room. Now, as for those air bubble looking things, I'm guessing they have something to do with the anti glare coating Apple uses. But weirdly enough, though, the only thing that seems to get rid of them is the whoosh microfiber cloth. I've tried a ton of others, but they don't work as well. But that being said, there is still one stubborn spot that just won't come off no matter what I try. But of course, neither of those issues are anywhere near deal breakers. So they're pretty easy to look past considering just how good everything else about the screen is. Now the keyboard feels super nice to type on. Honestly, I think I might prefer it over the Logitech MX Mechanical on my desk. I know that's probably sacrilege to hardcore keyboard people, but hey, I'm like the most casual keyboard user. I also love having Touch ID right there at the top. Using it to unlock the Mac, approve settings, and even confirm Apple Pay purchases just makes things super fast and super seamless. But my biggest beef with this keyboard is the weirdly cheap plastic Apple uses for their keycaps. Within just a few days of using it, the keys start developing a glossy, worn out look from finger oils. And trust me, I'm pretty OCD about keeping my devices clean, but even though I wipe this thing down all the time, it's still noticeable. Yeah, it's not super terrible, and it doesn't take away from any of the functionality, 
but I do find it pretty annoying. Oh, and small tip, I do use an app called OneSwitch, which among other things, lets you lock the keyboard so you can clean it without accidentally mashing a bunch of keys. And before anyone says, just turn the computer off. Modern MacBooks have this really nice feature where every key is a power button. Anywho, the trackpad is absolutely massive. Like it's literally bigger than an iPhone 16 Pro Max. And at this point, it's pretty widely known that it's one of the best in the game and has been for a pretty long while. Super accurate, haptic feedback feels great, and I've had zero issues with things like palm rejection or ghost clicks. All I will say, this is like the nitpickiest of nitpicks and I hesitate to even point it out. But if your fingertips are even remotely dry, it's kind of allowed to swipe around on it. And moving on, battery life has been super solid. Even with about 16% battery health degradation after two years, I can still get through a full day on lighter to moderate tasks without plugging in. But that is assuming I'm not using better display or max brightness. Now, of course, when I'm in something like DaVinci Resolve or Blender, it does drain a lot faster, but that's to be expected. But for everyday use, it's been excellent. There are apps like Al Dente that'll keep the battery between 20% and 80%, but I didn't discover that till well into my time with this device. So if I do end up getting the battery replaced or if I move to a new battery powered Mac, that's definitely on the checklist. Now performance. Most software that I use day to day, like Safari, Mail, Word, VS Code, it's all pretty lightweight. And for these tasks, M2 Max is completely overkill, like laughably so. But when I do use applications like MATLAB, Xcode, DaVinci Resolve, and even Blender, the extra power definitely comes in pretty handy. In MATLAB and Xcode, everything feels pretty snappy. Code compiles and runs just fine with no performance issues. Now I will say Xcode is particularly smooth and just delightful to use, which is probably because it's Apple software on Apple hardware. So that's no surprise at all. Now I did run a couple of benchmarks and I'll throw it over to Emmanuel to talk about those results. Thanks Emmanuel. Starting with Blender, here's what I found. In the classroom benchmark, the M2 Max took 5 minutes 47 seconds to render the scene, whereas the GPU cut that down to 40 seconds. This of course has nothing on the RTX 4070, which rendered the same scene in only 14 seconds. In Geekbench 6, it scored 2,796 on the CPU test and 145,848 on the GPU test using the Metal API. In Cinebench R23, it scored 1,644 in the single-core CPU test and 14,752 in the multi-core test. So more of a story, M2 Max still holds its own even for a two-year-old chip. Back to you, Emmanuel. Thanks for those numbers, Emmanuel. Now, I found that the M2 Max is also pretty good at virtualizing Windows 11 on ARM. I only have semi-extensive experience with VMware Fusion, but that runs amazing even with only two CPU cores and four gigs of memory allocated. I also tried Parallels for a bit and found that Windows generally runs smoother virtualized on this Mac with Parallels than on a Ryzen 7 5700X and an RTX 4070 desktop, which is kind of crazy. If anyone knows why, please feel free to enlighten me because I'm kind of mind blown, not going to lie. Now, I don't do much gaming in general and definitely not on this Mac, but I have tried some lighter games like Minecraft and it's pretty good. It consistently hits over 100 FPS, which is more than enough for most people. But let's be real though. Minecraft can probably run on a loaf of bread, so it's not a very high bar. And moving over to thermals real quick, this has pretty much never been an issue in most cases. I typically idle with the highest CPU temperatures around 30 to 40 degrees Celsius, and under load, it creeps up to around 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, although sometimes under really heavy load, like the Cinebench multi-core test, it'll get up to the mid to upper 90s and maybe even 101 or 102, which is kind of high but it's never throttled in my experience. I also only ever hear the fans when I manually max them out with TG Pro. By default, they barely turn on, and even when they do, it's never loud enough to hear. So overall, performance-wise, everything runs super smooth. And as a little bonus, I rarely ever see the spinning beach ball of death. And the crazy thing is, it does all that silently and coolly. Now let's talk about macOS. This was actually my first real experience with macOS after years of using Windows. I guess that's minus a couple of hours on an iMac back in fifth grade STEM camp back in the ancient days of 2014. But the transition was way smoother than I expected. Everything I need just works. On top of that, the interface is clean and the glass morphic design that was introduced in Big Sur looks great and the overall experience just feels super polished. Now the ecosystem features are also super convenient. Features like Apple Watch Unlock or Universal Clipboard are things I don't really think about, but immediately notice when they're not there. That being said, there are some little annoyances here and there, like not being able to adjust volume per app, but those are just nitpicks. 
Now, honestly, I think if you handed a brand new computer user a Mac, they'd probably get the hang of it faster than with Windows, but that's just me. So after all that praise, here's the catch. You can't actually buy this device new anymore. It's two years old, but you probably already knew that. But if you are planning on picking one up, you'd have to look at the refurbished market. And I've seen this spec go for anywhere between 1800 US dollars to 2500 US dollars, depending on the condition. Now I'm typically a huge proponent of Apple's certified refurbished store, but this one is either super rare or just gone with the wind entirely. So would I recommend this MacBook? Honestly, for 95% of people, absolutely not. Macs with Max chips are like, Macs with Max chips. Anyways, Macs with Max chips are like owning a Ferrari just to drive to the grocery store. Cool, yes, but not really practical. If you can live with 60 Hertz and no HDR, then the new M4 MacBook Air is a pretty insane value at 1,000 US dollars. We're gonna be getting the already powerful M4 chip, 16 gigabytes of unified memory, and a 256 gigabyte SSD, which is perfect for most people. Although 256 gigs may be a little low for power users, but oh well. Now, if you do need more performance or that sweet 120 hertz xdr display i'd probably say you should go for a refurbished m3 pro macbook pro 16 or a new m4 pro macbook pro 16 for future proofing although it wouldn't really future proof you by that much with the m3 pro you'll get 18 gigabytes of unified memory and a 512 gigabyte ssd all for around 2040 us dollars and with the m4 pro you'll get 24 gigabytes of unified memory and a 512 gigabyte SSD for about 2,500 US dollars. But in both cases, you'll also get more power than pretty much most people need. The Max chips are really only necessary for super heavy 3D work, high res video editing, or super intensive photo work. Otherwise, you're spending extra for performance, you may not even notice. And even then, the M4 base chip is no slouch. It handles a ton of protests just fine. Unless you're trying to render huge scenes in Blender on the daily, a base M4 MacBook Air can probably handle your workflow just fine. So pretty much two years in, the M2 Max MacBook Pro is still a beast, but it's not the perfect fit for everyone. Feel free to let me know if you're thinking about picking one up, switching to macOS, or just trying to figure out which MacBook is right for you. And if you've already got this machine, I'd love to hear what your experience has been. Hope you found this helpful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.